I'm Eric Shidley, and this is Astronomy Fundamentalized, Lecture 15, Galaxies. In this lecture, we'll describe the properties of our own Milky Way galaxy, together with the billions of other galaxies in our universe. I'll describe how we understand the distances between those galaxies and how astronomers classify them. As I'm giving this lecture in May of 2009, the uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis is uh, servicing the Hubble Space Telescope for the very last time, making some adjustments and corrections, adding some new equipment. It'll be the last time uh, that any significant work is done on the Hubble Space Telescope because it's long past uh, its serviceable life. And in fact, on a side note, it's also... Uh, nearing the end of the, the space shuttle era for NASA's space program. Nevertheless, Hubble has provided us with remarkable views of the universe, and any student of astronomy knows from just a little bit of research on uh, the internet that some of the best images available of objects in our universe come from the Hubble telescope, like this image here, which is often referred to as the Hubble Deep Field. The interesting thing about this photograph is that it reveals to us that our universe is populated with billions upon billions of collections of stars held together by gravity, um, uh, but uh, having only that characteristic in common. We see here a great deal of many different colors associated with these uh, galaxies in the image, and also we see some that are just uh, sort of fuzzy blobs, others that have some structure that we can identify. It's very fitting that the Hubble Space Telescope be named after Edwin Hubble because it was he who first uh, recognized that these fuzzy little blotches that appeared in uh, telescopic images were more than just nebulae. In fact, um, you may be familiar with the name uh, of the Andromeda Galaxy, which is our sort of sister spiral galaxy. Uh, it's the spiral galaxy nearest the Milky Way although not the nearest galaxy to the Milky Way, but the nearest spiral, and it's called the Andromeda Galaxy, but it was originally called the Andromeda Nebula until um, Hubble was able to demonstrate two important things about it. One, that it was not um, a cloud of gas and dust, but it was in fact, uh, in a sense, a cloud of stars, um, billions of stars moving together gravitationally in a, in a close group. He was also able to demonstrate that that grouping of stars that is the Andromeda Galaxy is very, very far away, much further away than anything that we uh, recognize in our own galaxy. So this is an important aspect to the structure of the universe, that stars arrange themselves in galaxies and that the galaxies arrange themselves in the universe, that their structure uh, and their descriptions are varied uh, and it turns out quite fascinating. Our own galaxy, which uh, is called the Milky Way galaxy, if you were unaware of that, your location in the universe, is a galaxy considered to be typical of um, spiral galaxies in our universe. So far as we can tell by measurements that we've taken um, using radio astronomy <clears throat> within our uh, own galaxy, our galaxy is about 100,000 light years in diameter. The Earth is not at the outer edge of the galaxy, but is in fact about halfway to the center of the galaxy, 28,000 light years from the center. Our galaxy has some uh, features that are typical uh, of most galaxies uh, of its type. Uh, first of all, there is a galactic disk, and our sun is in, uh, located in the galactic disk, and this gives you the impression that the, that the galaxy is flat and circular. The reality is that the galaxy is in fact spherical, if you consider all of the objects that are participating in orbiting the central nucleus of the galaxy. Around uh, the, the disk is what is known as the halo, where globular clusters of stars orbit in random directions about the nucleus. The disk itself orbits pretty much all together as it rotates uh, you know, with a period of about... Um, uh, with a period of about 20,000 years, uh, I'm sorry, 20 million years, orbits around the, um, the nucleus. The stars in the disk are generally younger because in the disk are regions where uh, gases are available for the production of new stars. The stars in the globular clusters of the halo 
uh, our older stars because of the inavailability of material to produce new stars in that region. As already mentioned, our galaxy has spiral arms. This doesn't make it unique in the universe. As we look off in all directions, we see uh, other galaxies that have these uh, arrangements you see here in this uh, very clearly two spiral arms on this particular galaxy. It is very, very easy to look at a picture like this and to imagine that the galaxy is rotating and the spiral arms are being pulled along with it. And uh, it's also easy to imagine that if we were able to watch this as a movie millions, if not billions of years into the future, we would see this galaxy wind up and these arms would get tighter and tighter. That's not, in fact, what's happening. The spiral arms of a galaxy do not rotate with the stars of the galaxy itself. What's happening is that the <clears throat> spiral arms are regions of density where the stars slow down in their orbit about the central nucleus. In a way, the spiral arms are a bit like a traffic jam. Imagine uh, at a particular radius from the nucleus, it's like a track, and there are cars on this track driving around in a constant circle around the nucleus. But periodically, there are regions on the track where cars have a reason to slow down. Perhaps they, uh, the, the track is rough in that area. Uh, and so they hit the brakes and little traffic jams occur. So what's really going on in this image as we look at the spiral arms is that the, spar the, the stars in the galaxy are traveling through the spiral regions and slowing down so that there's a traffic jam and we have more dense uh, star regions. This is important uh, for uh, the, the evolution and star formation in these galaxies because it's in the spiral arm region that the density of gases becomes significant enough and there's enough hydrogen available. Uh, in close enough proximity to create new stars. So the basic idea there is that the spiral, when the galaxy rotates, the spiral arms do not rotate with it. The spiral arms are regions of greater star density and stars move in and move out uh, on a regular basis. There are other spirals around us that are, are um, like our own own galaxy, many, many spiral galaxies. We look out and we see them. Some of them we see edge on and some of them we see from the top in varying angles because naturally the galaxies that we view when we look out in the universe are not uh, uh, very considerate as to their orientation in space. <clears throat> we see a, a spiral galaxy here that has many spiral arms where the previous one just had uh, two. And in fact, we've identified uh, that our own Milky Way galaxy has several spiral arms, um, and they have names. The Sagittarius arm, the Perseus arm, the Centaurus arm, the Cygnus arm, uh, and the Orion arm. And Earth uh, is uh, in the Orion arm of the galaxy. I'm not sure that that's a terribly useful piece of information. If you find yourself lost in the galaxy, uh, finding your way home may be more significant a problem than just telling someone uh, or asking directions to the Orion arm. Nevertheless, our galaxy has several spiral arms, and they all have lovely names. We can see our galaxy <clears throat> with the naked eye from the surface of the Earth. Now, if you live in a region where there's a lot of background light in a city, for example, it's not likely that you'll see this. But if you find yourself out in a country or rural area uh, or in a mountainous region where there's not a lot of light pollution, you can look up in the sky and see a... Uh, bright, dusty region. One might even say milky region in the sky. It uh, looks something like this. Now, this, this photograph um, has been uh, <clears throat> doctored a bit in order to enhance our viewing of it, but this is the Milky Way galaxy viewed edge on. <clears throat> you have to appreciate the fact that the Earth is uh, orbiting the Sun, and the Sun is in the Milky Way galaxy. We are, in fact, in the disk. <clears throat> So we cannot step back and have a look at the Milky Way galaxy with any telescope that we have available. And in fact, to launch a telescope far enough away that we could turn back and look uh, back at our galaxy and take a picture of it is quite beyond our capacity. So here we are inside the Milky Way galaxy, right where we're supposed to be, looking edge on into the galaxy itself. So we see a greater density in st of stars along this line as we look into the to the disk. If we look above or below the disk, we see a much lower density of stars and, in fact, can see much further. An interesting uh, aspect to this um, image that I want to appreciate now before I move on 
is that uh, this is a visible light image. This is an image that you might see looking through uh, a typical optical telescope, looking through the eyepiece. What we see characteristic here is there's a lot of light associated with a dense uh, region of stars that is the Milky Way galaxy, but also there are darker regions, particularly in the top third of the photograph, where dust in the galaxy is obscuring our view in towards the center of the galaxy. It turns out for studying the structure of the galaxy, visible light is not the best option. Our galaxy is much easier to view in infrared. Here's an infrared vision of the view of the galaxy from Earth looking in. Now, we are inside uh, the disk, about halfway towards the center uh, of the galaxy. And so um, this image that we have here in a Mercator pro projection is a 360 degree view from the point of view of Earth. So on the leftmost and rightmost edge of the, di of the picture, we're looking... Um, out of the galaxy, and of course at the center we see uh, that our galaxy has a well-defined disk and a nucleus uh, at the center, uh, and the nucleus is of particular interest to astronomers. The reason for this is that as we look towards the center of our galaxy, and this image I believe is an X-ray image of um, the nucleus of the galaxy, we see a very, very violent uh, and dramatic dynamic system we've been able to identify that there are several objects very near the center of our galaxy which are in orbit about the center at velocities near 80% the speed of light. The interesting thing about that is that makes it possible for us to determine that if there is an object at the center of the galaxy that is producing the gravitational force that draws those near galactic center objects around in orbit, we'd be able to calculate what that mass is. And then it turns out the current estimate for the mass of the object at the center of the, of the uh, galaxy is about 2.5 times 10 to the 6th solar masses. That means whatever is at the center of our solar system, it is 1 million times more massive than our own sun. That's a very dramatic thing because one of, the, what, one of the things we realize is that when stars begin their life with masses much greater than our sun, let's say a star that begins life 20 times more massive than our sun, there's a possibility that when that star reaches its death phase that it could become a black hole. Well, if a, a 20 solar mass star can become a black hole, then a 1 million mass object would most assuredly be a black hole. And in fact, the general theory of relativity predicts that it should be so. At the center of our galaxy, there is most likely a super massive black hole. This object has, been, has uh, taken on the name Sagittarius A, and it is a very strong emitter of X-ray radiation. The center of the galaxy is a violent place, and no stars that exist at the center of the galaxy would have planets that would support life um, because the environment of the center of the galaxy is um, a little bit too energetic and, uh, as I'll coin a term, optically poisonous um, for those sorts of things. But there are still... Uh, because of the density of the center of our galaxy and the violence of the things that are going on there uh, and the difficulty of observing it, because between us and the center of the galaxy there's a fantastic amount of dust and stars and other matter that obscures our view of the center, there's uh, much that is still unknown about the center of the galaxy and this is ongoing um, astrophysical research. You may um, wonder at this point how we know... Um, the distances to other galaxies. What basically happened historically is Hubble was looking at the Andromeda Nebulae and uh, identified that it was individual stars, but also identified that it was extraordinarily far away, more distant than any other object in our own galaxy. So how is it that you can tell the distances of things that are very far away if you can't just go out into space and with a measuring tape string it from here to here and say that it's so many meters? That's obviously impractical. We need indirect evidence to make it possible for us to measure those distances. The answer is variable stars. It turns out that in our galaxy, even in our local neighborhood, and in other galaxies all throughout the universe, variable stars exist. Variable stars are stars whose luminosity changes periodically over time. 
I don't just mean from time to time, but I mean at regular intervals, like a clock. The brightness of the star will increase and then decrease in regular pulsations. Now, this is not to confuse uh, us with pulsars, which are rapidly rotating neutron stars that rotate in very, very short time periods. That's a different thing. Variable stars, the mechanism for that is um, associated with what we formerly discussed about the radiation pressure that is caused by um, the nuclear reactions that go on inside of a star. The radiation pressure pushes outward and the gravitational pressure pushes inward and they exist in equilibrium. In our sun, in particular, we're happy that this equilibrium persists very evenly. If our star, if our sun was variable, we would be quite unhappy because the radiation that we would receive at Earth would change periodically in a significant way and most likely make life on Earth impossible. But there are other stars where there is variability in this battle between the radiation pressure and the gravitational pressure of the star. And they basically fall into two types, RR Lyrae variables and Cepheid variables. The names may disturb you a little bit because they're um, uh, sort of obscure in their language. The reason uh, for these names is that these types of objects that are discovered are typically um, named after the first one discovered. So when it comes to RR Lyrae variables, the first variable star of that type was discovered. Um, it, its name is RR, and it's in the constellation Lyra. And the Cepheid variables, Cepheus was the first star discovered. Uh, and so they have names according to the first star. But there are many, many examples of this. We find them all over our galaxy, the variable stars. The main distinct, the distinction between these two types is that RR Lyrae variable stars all have pretty much the same luminosity. They have roughly the same intensity. Cepheid variables are different because their luminous intensity actually has a relationship to the period with which they, uh, which the variability occurs, the period with which that oscillation takes place. Here we see our favorite Hertzsprung-Russell diagram where we organize our stars. We find that um, a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> that the Lyrae variables and the Cepheid variables are all stars larger than our sun and further up the main sequence than our sun. They have greater luminosities and the RR Lyrae variables have uh, luminosities about a hundred times the luminosity of our sun, but the Cepheid variables have variable luminosities, some having luminosities as low as the Lyrae variables, but others having luminosities greater than 10,000 times um, the luminosity of our own sun. The key here is that there's a period and a luminosity relationship. So when I look at um, this first graph here is for a um, Lyrae variable, uh, and we see that the period is rather short and that the intensity increases dramatically and decreases dramatically as well. And there's also this intermediate bump in between. The lower graph uh, is a graph of... Um, a Cepheid variable, and we see that the period is longer and also that it has a distinctively different shape. This makes it possible for astronomers to distinguish between these two types of variable stars. The period is longer and, and a, a time period of, it looks like here to be about, well, about one, two, three and a half days for the period of this Cepheid variable in the bottom uh, graph, the, the periods vary significantly. Um, Cepheid variables have a range of periods from a few days to uh, months, and it makes us, uh, it provides us an interesting relationship because the luminous intensity of Cepheid variables depends on the period. The inset diagram to the um, to the right, which is a visible diagram taken um, sequentially, shows a variable star where we can see uh, the image of the same star. We see how every star in the entire field of view is doubled. Every star has an identical star right next to it. That's because the two images were taken at different times and superimposed one on top of the other. When we see the variable star, um, I think in this case it's a Cepheid variable, but we see the uh, variability in uh, obvious change in the luminous intensity of the star, which is a change in the apparent brightness of the star. So we have um, 
this period luminosity relationship for the Cepheids and all of the Lyrae variables are a little bit less than 100 solar units in their luminous intensity. And the Cepheids, we can determine what their luminous intensity is based on the pulsation period. For example, if I view a Cepheid and I measure its pulsation period and I find out that it's 20 days, then I'll go along the x-axis to 20 and then up and I'll see that it's less than 10,000. Uh, in its luminosity, say about 9,000 something. I would obviously, if I was doing this experimentally, I would have a better scale on my y-axis. Nevertheless, it's possible knowing the pulsation period of my Cepheid variable star to determine its luminosity. So this is the deal. This is what I'm saying. You can figure out the luminosities of these variable stars just by observing their behavior from Earth. Well, the question is, who cares? The reason why I care is that the brightness that a star that a star appears when viewed from earth is related to its luminous intensity here i have a diagram that shows several candles in fact it's the same candle and the candle has a certain intrinsic uh, brightness certain luminosity to it but if i put a candle further and further away the brightness of that candle is less and less and that less this is a, a principle that we talked about before when we're talking about apparent magnitude of stars, the apparent brightness of stars, and that the intensity of the light that's emitted by a star diminishes as one over the square of the distance. The idea here is that if I can look at a star from the surface of the Earth and estimate its apparent brightness, how bright it appears, and if I can know the luminosity of the star, because it's a variable star and that I can... Uh, I know how their behavior is related to their luminosity, then it's possible for me to solve the equation for the distance to those stars. So what you do is you look around uh, in our own galaxy for variable stars that you know the periods of and the luminosities of, and you figure out their distances, and you discover that there's a period luminosity relationship. And then if you're Edwin Hubble, you look off to the Andromeda galaxy, and you see that there are stars in the Andromeda galaxy that are variable stars. Now, you can imagine that that's quite a tricky thing to do, to be making close observations of stars at distant galaxies. And so, obviously, there's an issue of the, uh, the, the power of the telescope that you use to make that ob observation. But nevertheless, you look to a distant galaxy and you see a variable star. You imagine that it behaves the same way as variable stars do in our own galaxy. And so, you determine its luminosity based on that. Knowing its luminosity and how... a bright that star is apparently when viewed from the surface of the earth, you can calculate the distance to that star. Now, obviously, this would only work for galaxies very nearby, but it was enough for us to recognize that the galaxies that surround us in our universe are fantastically far away, and that made it possible for us to recognize them as bodies independent of our own galaxy. For galaxies that are much further away, far enough away that these period luminosity relationships don't work. Um, we, we're going to return to this idea of redshift as a little bit of a review. We know that um, light ha uh, emitted by stars has particular emission and absorption spectra and that the spectral lines that we find in radiation that we collect here on Earth is indicative of the elements. Uh, and so a spectrum is like a fingerprint. But due to the Doppler effect, if a source is moving uh, away from us, then we find that all of the spectral lines that we expect in the spectrum of, of, of light from that object are shifted to the red end of the spectrum. If the object is traveling toward us, we find that they're blue shift. And here is a remarkable uh, remarkable fact, I wish you would say, about modern astronomy is we have recognized that when you look out in the universe and look at all of those galaxies, the galaxies in the Hubble Deep Field, for example, all those galaxies that we saw, billions and billions of galaxies, they all appear to be redshifted. That is, all of the galaxies in the universe seem to be moving away from us, which is a very, very curious notion that we'll have to come back to in a later lecture because it has significant uh, implications for the cosmology of our universe. But for the moment, let me recognize that... Um, uh, I can identify the redshift of a galaxy and therefore know how rapidly it is uh, receding from, the, from our point of view here on Earth. 
What Hubble recognized is that there was a relationship between the recessional velocity of galaxies and the, uh, d the distance to the galaxies that could be measured by some other standard. And so we have this uh, very, very famous Hubble plot here where it, it's discovered that there's a linear relationship between how far away a galaxy is uh, and how redshifted it is, that is, its recessional velocity. And so with this graph, we see that it's sort of linear here, and we can fit a line to it, and the slope of that line is called Hubble's constant, or Hubble's parameter, and it's given the symbol H sub zero, as you see here in this diagram. This diagram is giving me an idea that I could hedge my bets and say that the slope of the thing was a little bit steeper or a little bit less because of the errors involved in measuring the redshift and distances to galaxies in our universe. It's important to respect the fact that despite, that despite these, these results are very dramatic and impressive and I'd like to get very excited about them, I have to appreciate that they are in fact measurements and measurements are subject to uncertainty, which is one of the reasons why astronomers are constantly working to improve the, the techniques and analysis of um, techniques for collecting and analysis of data that we receive um, from deep in space. Nevertheless, Hubble was able to predict that, uh, that um, the recessional velocity of an object or the redshift of a galaxy is associated with its distance. That means that if I can look deep into the universe further than I have any distance standard to measure and simply measure the redshift, then by using this curve as a prediction, I can calculate or uh, make an approximation of the distance to that object. And we have looked out and seen uh, the furthest uh, galaxies. Um, there's a cluster of galaxies called the Abel Cluster, I believe, which is the furthest away, and it seems um, that that cluster of galaxies is more than 13 billion light years um, from Earth. And so that gives us sort of a scale of the universe, a rough size of, uh, of the universe. Of course, it turns out to be true that we can't see all of the universe at this point, but as I said, issues like that are for another lecture when we discuss cosmology. For now, we have Hubble's Law, a relationship between redshift and the distance to galaxies, and the notion that we find that all of the galaxies in the universe are traveling away from us. So we look up with our Hubble telescope and start um, viewing galaxies uh, all over the place, and we discover uh, that there are a, a great many of different uh, uh, structures. Um, and so there's, there's a kind of classification system that has evolved. That system is very imprecise, um, and it's changing all the time. Um, but there are some basic things that we want to look out for. In the upper left here, we have a typical spiral galaxy. It has a bulging nucleus and a clearly defined disk, and also regions of high star, st stellar density that form um, the arms, making the galaxy appear to be a whirlpool, despite the fact that we recognize that the spiral arms are really the traffic jams where stars slow down in their orbits around and uh, the density increases. To the right of that spiral is a very, very peculiar structure indeed, one that astronomers are still working on uh, explaining fully, doing numerical modeling um, on very, very powerful computers to describe this. This is known as a barred spiral. Once again, we have a nucleus, although the nucleus in this case is a little bit fuzzy. And we have a disk, and we have two very clear spiral arms, but the arms don't spiral to the center of the galaxy. Instead, there is a bar which connects them horizontally. Uh, so this galaxy is referred to as a barred spiral. On the lower left, we have what is known as an elliptical galaxy. It has no disk, and no clear nucleus. Certainly, it has a greater stellar density at the center than it does at the edges, but there's no um, clear increase in density at the center. It also is elliptical in shape. Ellipticals range from galaxies which are nearly spherical uh, to galaxies which are almost cigar-shaped, where their elliptical um, shape is stretched out uh, to resemble um, more of a cartoon version of a cigar. Elliptical galaxies vary in size significantly. There are galaxies that are uh, 20 times uh, the size of our own Milky Way galaxy, and there are other elliptical galaxies that are so sparse in the number of stars um, that uh, we have, for a time, looked straight through them without noticing that they were, in fact, there. They're very difficult to identify, very low density, very small galaxies. 
On the lower right, we see a classification of galaxies known as the irregulars. We have two irregular galaxies in, in close proximity uh, to our own Milky Way galaxy. They're called the large megalanic and small megalanic clouds. They're called megalanic because they're, um, in effect, orbiting our own galaxy. There's a gravitational interaction between our galaxies and these other galaxies, and uh, this can happen in the universe. As a matter of fact, um, you can do a little research and find images of galaxies that are in fact colliding, gravitationally attracting each other till the galaxies pass through one another, which causes a great disturbance of any kind of regular structure that the galaxy would have and uh, disturbs it. Uh, there's There are theories out there that suggest that these irregular galaxies, um, the large megalanic and the, and the small megalanic cloud, at one time passed through the Milky Way galaxy, and that's what caused their structure to be um, so greatly scrambled. Hubble himself developed a classification scheme for galaxies, uh, which is often known as the Hubble tuning fork. I present it here because it's a very traditional and um, um, classic uh, aspect of astronomy, but um, I'm learning now from all of the astronomers that I know that the classification of galaxies is moving away from the Hubble tuning fork classification system. Nevertheless, Hubble recognized that there were elliptical galaxies and he numbered them from zero to seven. Zero being a galaxy that was spherical and seven being a cigar-shaped uh, galaxy. After the ellipticals, we get the spirals, where we branch off into the two kinds, the barred spiral uh, and the normal spiral. And the spirals are distinguished according to the way the arms form. Uh, we see that an SC spiral has a large number of spiral arms, where an SA uh, spiral has a uh, few arms. We see that among the barred spirals, we have uh, a, a change in the nucleus size of the spiral. The first of the barred spirals, the SBA, has a very prominent and large nucleus, where the SBC has a very small nucleus. We also see that the SBA uh, barred spiral has longer spiral arms than the SBC spiral, and this classification scheme rec represents a continuum of the descriptions of uh, spiral galaxies. Now, when we look up into the sky with our Hubble telescope and all of the telescopes that are currently operating, um, uh, collecting data for astronomers, we find billions and billions and billions and billions of galaxies, hundreds of billions of galaxies. Uh, and they all are worthy of our attention, but there's only so much time. Uh, and so there are activities going on right now where the general public is given the opportunity to uh, look at images of galaxies and to classify them. And the reason for that is that classification of galaxies uh, is important to um, the statistics of the cosmology of our universe. The understanding how many spirals there, there are and how many bars and how many ellipticals and of what type um, will ultimately help us understand the evolution of galaxies and the evolution of our universe at large. But you have to go out there and take the census. You have to classify them. If you set a computer to looking at images and a computer has some algorithm that helps it distinguish between a spiral, a barred spiral, and an elliptical, you can do that. And it takes a computer a very, very long time to identify one galaxy from another and do it accurately. The human mind can do it much, much faster. And so uh, astronomers are releasing images of galaxies to the general public and asking anyone who's interested um, to sit at a computer screen and classify galaxies um, so that we might have better statistics of the population. But the census of galaxies in our universe 